Please join me in the call to worship. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together. To it, the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For there, for there the thrones for judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you, Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. A voice is crying, the call to confession. A voice is crying out in the wilderness, repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. We lift up our souls to you, O God, knowing that we have not always worked closely with you. In fact, sometimes we have stopped walking altogether. We seem to revisit the same problems over and over without really looking for ways to move forward. So much in our eyes and in our world seems played out and tired. Forgive us, God, for our lack of faith in your power and your promise. Help us to hope even when things seem hopeless. This is the first Sunday in Advent. We light candles today to celebrate hope. If you have a candle handy, please light it at this time. Each day, each moment of our lives is a gift from God and an invitation to begin again. God offers us this gift <clears throat> not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Full of grace and love, God reaches out to us even when we are unsure of how to respond. What a wonderful surprise. There is yet hope for us and for the world. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us express God's forgiveness towards one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace, everyone. And also with you. Peace and be with, with you, you, everyone. Also with you. Please feel free to unmute, and we'll take a moment to chaotically uh, <laughs> welcome and greet and wish peace to each and all. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Hi. Hello. Peace be with you. Hello. Gabriel. Everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi, Victor. Thanks, Sephora and Caleb. More. Oh, so nice to see everyone. He's not done. Hello. I hope you all have big. Uh, meals of some kind this week. Yeah, uh, well, welcome to each and to all. Uh, why don't we mute all here? Where's your person? Come on, Kurt. 
And I just want to say a, a welcome to each and all uh, for this, the first Sunday of Advent. To me, the first Sunday of Advent always feels a little soon, but um, the 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 stores and our retail environment has been celebrating Christmas since you know the end of August. So uh, within the 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 pace of the world around us, uh, we're kind of latecomers to the game. And Advent always begins with um, some scriptures that put us right on edge. It doesn't start with stories of babies in the manger. It starts of, about with stories about surprise and abrupt beginnings. But such is the story that we enter into each year anew and afresh. This is the first Sunday of the Christmas of the Christian year. Um, the Christian year begins with Advent. It doesn't begin with Easter. It doesn't begin with Pentecost. It doesn't begin with that sense of joyful arrival or announcement or victory. It begins with longing. It begins with a sense of needing and wanting and yearning for something to come and to show up in our lives. I know that this time of year can be a hectic time of year for many of us, and it also can be a lonely and dark time of year for many of us. But I really do believe and I have found for myself in my life that by embedding myself in Christmas as it is uh, slowly arrives and unfurls in the context of a Christian church and not with its, um, you know, extravagant abundance as it appears in the broader culture, by easing into it as Advent leads us to do. This whole time, this, this dark season can become a real blessing, a time when we feel the advent of hope into our lives. And I, I pray that it may be for you this year that way. There's a lot um, going on at Westminster this month. There's a booklet that describes all of what's happening that's printed out and you'll find it in um, our sanctuary, but it's also available on our website. I wanna highlight two quick things. One is that uh, this coming Saturday, uh, the Saturday at the end of this coming week, we are having a hanging of the greens, uh, a bagel uh, breakfast party on Saturday from 10 until probably, we should be done by 11.30 or noon. This is uh, hosted by and sponsored by the Christian Life and Leadership Team. I hope um, Many of you will come by the church at any point during that morning time. And um, there's jobs for people who can lift things and jobs for people who want to uh, sit at the table and take care of a few uh, little things that need to be done there. Um, however you come, we welcome you and we will find a job for you. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is next Sunday, exactly a week from today, we're having an Advent workshop after worship. This is something that's been a Westminster tradition for a while, and we haven't done it for a while um, due to COVID restrictions. And we're coming back into that uh, tradition of an intergenerational time of crafts and connecting, and there may even be some Christmas cookies involved, and that will happen right after worship uh, a week from today, in-person only uh, worship and in-person only Advent workshop. I hope you'll be able to join that as well. And now friends, let's continue with this online only worship service. Uh, with the prayer for illumination and scripture lessons to follow. Paul has something to say. <laughs> Paul has his hand up. <laughs> Please don't forget the class, the discussion group that Heather and I are going to be leading this coming Thursday, Thursday morning. Okay, Heather, do you want to say something about that? It's going to be awesome. <laughs> 
10 to 11 30 and there will be snacks involved with that that's in person only as well and then um on zoom this morning dave mcmillan's advent of uh, reflections on poetry began and that will be in person only next sunday starting at 9 a.m all other news and announcements you can find on our website in the e-news or in other places shall we continue with worship let us pray Holy God, our hope and strength by the power of your spirit, prepare the way in our hearts for the coming of your word so that we may see the glorious signs of your promise fulfilled. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of God of Jacob, and, um, that he may, oh, sorry. Um, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Our second scripture lesson is from Matthew 24, verses 36 through 44. Jesus said, but about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven, nor the son, but only the father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the son of man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the son of man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had, had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must be ready for the son of man is coming at an unexpected hour. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Chris. So, so great to hear your voices. Would you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, these uh, Advent scriptures are, are, are sort of abrupt and scary and confusing. They're not the ones that I look forward to reading right after Thanksgiving, and especially this year when there's this reference about uh, the people of Noah who didn't pay attention to what was happening because they had been eating and drinking. Uh, that's, that's a tough one for me to hear right now because this week I have been eating and drinking. I hope you have too. But here's, here's a way to look at these scriptures. What if we looked at them through the lens of improv comedy? 
work with me here. Uh, have any of you ever been to an improv comedy show? Let's let's just get a little uh, survey here. Have any of you been to you know Mopco up in uh, Schenectady? Or it, it, there's actually a, a, a real fun TV show uh, that works with real straight up improv sketch comedy called um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Uh, anybody ever seen that show? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So the the there's a, a lot of different formats of different sketches and games that these shows kind of go through. But one thing that's similar through a lot of the different improv comedy sketches is this idea of getting input from the audience, right? Uh, so, for example, the host will stand up and say, "Okay, everybody, give me give me a location, give me three characters, two objects, and a, a special occasion." You know, and people will start yelling things out, you know, uh, a birthday party, a refrigerator, uh, Dracula, Richard Nixon, Taylor Swift, and the, the people who are there on stage have to right there on the spot, uh, somehow create a story, a scene, a skit uh, in which all of these uh, elements suggested by the um, in-person audience, all of those elements are included. And really one of the amazing things to see when you see improv comedy is that they do that as soon as they get the suggestions, right? They they don't have like a five minute huddle in the back. They don't take a half hour to sort of map out a plot and discuss it as a group. In fact, they start the scene just as soon as those suggestions begin. And one person will step out on the stage and begin the scene and everybody else has to sort of just work with what's happening and the scene, the story emerges right there on the stage in front of everybody watching. <laughs> can any of you imagine doing that? Can, can you imagine doing it? I mean, have you given it a try maybe? Maybe not on stage, although perhaps some of you have. But um, sometimes this is even offered as a workshop or as a party game. Have any of you done something like that? Okay, well, a few years back, I I, uh, I participated in a workshop. It was it was a, a leadership workshop that was led by this guy who was trained in improv comedy in Baltimore. He was it was a real star in Baltimore, and he decided I I think it was a money making scheme for him. But his side hustle was that he uh, would put together workshops from various community leaders and teach those people how to do improv comedy. Now, believe me, none of the results of this workshop were, it was not anything you would pay to see, but it was pretty fascinating to learn at least the rules, the parameters, the sort of ideas behind improv comedy. And the one that really stuck with me was the one that this fellow said was the absolute foundation for everything that you see uh, in an improv show. And that was this principle that he called agree and build. And I've also heard it in other places described as the principle of yes and. Okay, and the idea is that you accept what Whatever it is that is happening in the scene in front of you, and then you add to it. Makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if if somebody, uh, so another person in the improv group stands up and says, "Hey, I'm Dracula, and I'm going to this birthday party," you don't respond by saying, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, I was going to be Dracula, <laughs> you be Taylor Swift." <laughs> you really have to just say, "Oh, okay." you're Dracula, and then um, you respond to that, including you could say, oh, well, what do you know? I'm Dracula too. And that would then allow some kind of creative and perhaps even hilarious scene to unfold. Something interesting begins when the people who are involved with that skit, with that game, with that exercise, deeply consent to whatever it is that has already happened, that is unfolding on the stage, when people consent to that, they can then 
find their and, their yes and, their agree and build. They can engage with what's happening creatively once they agree to what is already occurring. Right? You understand? Agreeing to what is happening unleashes the creativity of everyone involved. But it is not easy to do because many of us, from the minute we get started, create a story in our own heads, be it on stage or be it in life. We have a way that we think things should play out. And when they don't go that way, it is so hard to agree. Now, this, of course, brings me to the morning scripture reading from Matthew. Now, every year at the beginning of Advent, the lectionary assigns scriptures that are about the end of time, about the apocalypse, right? Now, these, these readings, as the one today, they often sound really harsh and scary, um, but they're all over scripture. As many of you know, the Old Testament Prophets talk about the end of the world, and the entire Christian Bible ends with the book of Revelation, which is really one long description about how the world is going to end. <laughs> and as you probably know, even after the Bible was written, um, this tendency to look forward to the future and predict that it's all going to come crashing down soon, well, that seems to be a human tendency that has sort of shown up in our culture, in our life together again and again and again, right? Who, who here remembers Y2K? <laughs> now, maybe you roll your eyes a little bit at those passages. Maybe you um, think they're all sort of silly and wait until we get to some of the later weeks of Advent when we'll start hearing those nice stories about Mary and angels and Joseph and shepherds and kings. But here we have one to deal with this morning. Now, it seems to me that there's a couple ways to struggle with these scriptures that a couple of ways to just address these scriptures that allow us to dismiss them right off. And, and one is that we could just acknowledge that they're wrong. Just the way in which all of the people who were worried about Y2K ended up basically being wrong. Airplanes didn't fall out of the sky. Um, the, the world didn't come to an end. Um, and all those other predictions that have been made um, that the world is going to end soon. Well, here we are, right? Um, it hasn't ended yet. Uh, and so it's easy to decide that all of that is based on some sort of misunderstanding. It, it, it's based on some sort of mistake. You know, Jesus Christ hasn't come back and plucked faithful followers out of the field and taken them away to some other different place. And if we see it all as a misunderstanding or a mistake, then we can just basically ignore these passages of scripture and just get on with our life. And it appears that most of us, including those who built a church in 1862 and decided that it would still probably be there to worship as a place of worship for many years to come, well, all of the world that we live in is sort of based on the understanding that the future uh, will, that, that life will continue into the future, right? That on that basis, we have children. On that basis, we save for retirement. On that basis, we build institutions and make plans. And so in some ways, we have to ignore this stuff if we're going to get on with life. And there's another way, of course, to read these scriptures, which is to read them as not really so much as prescriptive about the future, but as descriptive about uh, the present. And that's a way in which a lot of scholars have dealt with these passages. They point out that the Gospel of Matthew was written uh, by somebody who had, you know, several uh, decades, maybe many decades after Jesus was walking and talking on earth. And during that time, really tough things had happened, including that uh, Jerusalem was invaded and the temple was destroyed. And the temple had been at the heart of religious life for 
observant Jews in that area, most of whom were the followers of all of the followers of Jesus uh, in that initial group were observant Jews. And so in a lot of ways, life had come to a crashing end. And so here it is in scripture, a, a, a Jesus predicting that what people had already experienced would happen and then promising that God would still be there, you know, in the mix of all of that. But even when we see these passages as descriptive of a past disaster, they're, they're not particularly helpful for how we should be living now. Both of those ways of looking at these passages allow us to dismiss them. It, it, they, it, it, they don't, we don't see them as being instructive. But I've been wondering about what if we asked a different kind of question to this passage? Instead of saying, well, did this happen or didn't? Or will this happen or will it not? What if we ask of this passage, what do you have to teach me? Right? You can think of all of the ways in which these kinds of scriptures are wrong, but how are they right? And as soon, as soon as I ask that question, I'm struck by how stories like the ones we just read call us to be deeply attuned to the present moment and call us to be so present to what is happening right now that we can immediately respond to changes when they come, changes in the environment as soon as they happen. And that kind of responsiveness, that kind of ability to be present and responsive, <clears throat> that's built on a deep ascent to the present, right? It, that kind of responsiveness doesn't allow us to sit there and argue about is this really happening or not? I mean, be it, is it really happening that the world is going to flood or is it really happening that a thief is breaking into the house or is it really happening that the world is changing in significant ways? We don't stand back and debate that or argue about that. We're very, very present and attuned to what is actually happening now. And when you are attuned like that, the only thing that's possible to say is yes, to agree, to agree to the present, to noticing and saying, yes, this is happening. Now, saying yes to a situation that's difficult or traumatic or problematic, that, that can be a really hard thing to do, right? It can be a really hard thing to do because it can feel like we're agreeing that what is happening is a good thing. It can make it sound like we have to say that all of this is okay with us, that the present situation is exactly what we would choose or what we would like for ourselves or for those we love. It's like asking all of those people in the story of Noah who are caught up with eating and drinking and getting married, asking all of them if they think it would be a really good idea to flood the world and start all over. That's not, that's not something that anybody would agree to, especially those who are enjoying life right now as it is. But here's the thing, the world is changing, right? The world was changing for in the story of Noah and the world was changing for the people who followed Jesus. And for that matter, our world is changing too. Our world has changed. Our world has changed corporately and for each of us in our own particular individual lives, um, our world has changed. And we can respond to that by um, resisting it all by hanging our heads and saying, oh, well, that's it. Life is never going to be good again. Our best days are over. The, the, my story is coming to an end. Or we can say yes to the present moment. And then after the yes comes the and. That's what we learned from improv comedy, that agreeing to what is currently underway, deeply assenting, to what is currently happening opens up the possibility 
of a creative response. And that's when things get really interesting because this, in the end, if we read these stories uh, with the understanding of the promises of God, we know that we're not just calling ourselves into a moment of human creativity or the ability to for humans to adapt and innovate. By saying yes and, by unleashing our own creative response to a situation, that's, that's when we encounter God. That's when we open ourselves up to an encounter with God who is always and even now continuing to create the world, right? Who's engaged constantly as a creative force in the world, who's always involved with the transformation of the world, who's always beginning, who's always inviting us to begin. Yes, and. Yes, and. Agree, and then build, and in that building, encounter the one who is building already. Hmm? And so that's where this Christian year begins. That's where the Christian year begins, not with Easter, not in a situation of uh, victory, not with Pentecost, with the arrival of all of the power of the Holy Spirit. It begins with, it begins with this moment when things are about to change, about to shift. And friends, we would like to argue with this. We would like to disagree with it, to resist it, to deny it, to refuse to acknowledge it. But what if we agreed? What if we said yes to all of what is changing and happening and moving and emerging in our life individually and in our life together? Yes, the world as we know it will not last forever. Yes, our lives are not infinite. Yes, all of this is going to come to an end. Yes, and. Let's agree, and now let's build. Let's agree, and then we can build. Amen.
before we uh, move to our time of joining in prayers with our partners, uh, let me invite uh, everybody here to um, let's build our prayers of the people and invite you to do that with the chat again, which is one of the benefits of meeting on Zoom here. Um, let's add into the chat prayers that we would like to share and invite other people to pray with us and for us. Um, celebrations, concerns, concerns for ourselves, those we know, those we love, and concerns for the world. And Gabriel, I'll hand it over to you to lead us in prayers with our partners. Thank you, Reverend Heather, for the timely and important message. Let us join our partners across the Atlantic Ocean in Ghana in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together again to worship you. Lord, answer our prayers. The future is now. So whatever we are doing, we are participating in the future. Being in the Thanksgiving period, we thank the almighty God for his protection and provision. God lead us during the rest of the year and the Advent season. Teach and help us to humble ourselves so you will exalt us. We pray, we say a prayer for the youth in the body of Christ to fully yield their will, energy, and appetite for soul winning. We pray for the leadership of the nations in these difficult economic times, for God's wisdom and direction to avert any global food crisis. We pray for journey mercies for all those who will be traveling during these seasons. We pray for the church's financial situation to improve as missions, evangelism, and projects all rely on funds. Please pray for members' businesses and financial conditions to improve as well. We pray for the leadership of the body of Christ in the nations. God grant the leaders grace and direction to lead your people. We pray for the victims of violence, including mass shootings all over the globe. We pray for the perpetrators of violence, especially those suffering from emotional and mental instabilities, as well as illnesses. We pray for all people who have faced the devastation of natural disasters in the world. Good God, give them hope and resources for a new, better life. Prayers of the people. The prayers of the, our partners are also our prayers. Great listener, as we open our hearts to you, we learn to listen. You hear every thought, every plea, every praise, and you whisper your wisdom. Help us to get out of the way so that we can love as you love. Your guidance is what we need so that what you desire will be accomplished and come to fruition. We thank God for healing 
Jembe Freeman, one of our Ebola orphans in Liberia, who had fallen very ill. We pray for all those who are suffering from physical, emotional, and mental illnesses worldwide. We pray for those infected with pathogens, including COVID-19, polio, monkeypox, and RSV, the common cause of hospitalizations in infants. God, we ask for protection for the pregnant women in times like this. Good God, protect and heal all people. We thank you, our God, for the hope, the advent season promises and brings. We pray for participation in the advent beggy branch and hanging of greens on Saturday, December 3rd, 10 a.m. to midday in our church. We pray for the general donations of the Scala in Winter Wear giveaway on Monday, December 12, from 4.15 to 6 p.m. Due to your mercy, O oh Lord, the emergency overflow shelter is operating. Good God bless us with volunteers. We thank you for the opportunity to assist the focus interfaith food pantry with cosmetics. All this we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Gabriel, for that beautiful prayer and invite Peter to. Sure. Any word okay. about the offering? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This weekend, we're thinking a lot about what we are thankful for as it is Thanksgiving weekend. As for me, I'm thankful for many things about Westminster Presbyterian Church. I'm thankful for my friends at church who offer me camaraderie and Christian fellowship. I'm thankful for the worship services with the great messages that Pastor Heather provides us. I'm also thankful for the mission work we do both locally and in Africa. And ask you to be thankful as well with your offerings. If you are especially thankful today, you can add a little to your offering. You can make your offerings easily online by going to the Westminster website and clicking on the Give tab at the top right and then the Online Giving tab. It's easy. And you may also mail your offering to the church or bring it next Sunday if you're coming. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Our closing hymn is Awake, Awake and Greet the New Morn. And after we have um, our end our service, we're going to continue in uh, fellowship with each other with our Zoom breakout rooms. So stay with us for a few more minutes after we sing and pray together.
Friends, go into this week trusting that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you this day forevermore. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, friends, we are going to move into a time of breakout rooms.